There you go. I'll say um, she. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we were talking about the things that have left to be discussed on our table, which is site plan review parameters. Um, and I, I do have um, one thing to add that I'd like to talk about, which is a floating zone that was requested by the Ag Committee um, or some suggested by in Ag Committee meetings. And um, then Ted had brought up that he would like to discuss applying parameters of a stricter zone within the first parcel over the border into a less restrictive zone. Um, I, which I, is some, me, I will say I, that, is, that is sometimes a thing that happens in cities, in places where you have small parcels. Um, so the city of Ithaca does it in some places where you know, they have one zone that allows um, taller buildings. And then, you know, if it is next to uh, a residential zone that requires more setbacks, the taller buildings might be required to be set back more than they would otherwise from the edge of the less intensive zone. Um, mm -hmm. well, let me add one amusing perspective, since you, especially since you just mentioned setbacks our most restrictive zones have less setbacks in the current design than the more restrictive ones, um, which in, it, in itself is quite interesting. Yeah, and I think we talked about that at great length in the last meeting. And Yes, I, I'm not asking to bring it up, but that's why I said some parameters where they make sense. That obviously won't make sense. Right. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm not really clear, Ted, exactly what parameters you would apply from which zone to what other zone. Well, why don't you um, pop up your chart and let's look. Or we can put it up till later in the meeting. I'm not, you know, not in a hurry, as long as it gets talked about. Let's see. Let's see if I'm gonna shoot. There you go. I think we would only be talking about these parameters. Uh, well, the, fir the first one that comes to mind, well, actually I was wrong. Uh, the high priority, uh, sorry, rural one and two, obviously the front and side yards don't matter, but let's say between a high priority and anything else, uh, the yards do matter. So does the cluster setback. And that's what I can see. I don't think the uh, transfer development rights would apply. So you would apply, you think we should apply, for example, a hundred yard or hundred foot setback to a parcel that's in rural one, if it's next to the high priority preservation zone? Um, possibly. Uh, just, I'm just saying possibly because another question I've had all along is front, side, and rear definitions are based on the direction of the road. Mm -hmm. And they also don't apply, they, how they apply to flag lots and, and things like that isn't yet determined, I don't think. But again, where reasonable, it might, yes. And the cluster setback. So for example, a, um, a rural one next to a high priority might, be, might in fact need to be 100 feet back from the border between the two of them. That would be, I'm assuming that's the rear yard. Well, actually all three. Doesn't seem unreasonable. I mean, a border is a border though. You've got but, to have a, establish a border somewhere. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You have to, you have to establish a border, but <laughs> the let's put it this way let's let's say just for example that a um, low density residential which would be was written right next to high priority preservation um 
one would argue that that's a freak of the way the way things happen. And it may be a border, but it does not make it any less important to protect a high priority preservation. So that's why a good reason to put a hundred foot in. I'm gonna change over to a map to help us think about this. Yep, sure. All right, so this dark green is high priority preservation, light mm -hmm. green is rural one and the squares is rural two and the pink is low density residential. So- you have room. What's that? I don't think you'll have room then in, in some of the narrower, I mean, if you, you won't be able to apply. The you, won't, you clearly won't be able to apply in the ones toward the bottom of the screen, but the ones that are to the right of Bald Hill Road toward the yeah. top of the screen, uh, that's that's the case that I'm talking about. Oh God, it's messy. Which might you you might use that as justification to uh, what was the word you used, Joel? To break you know to draw the line down the middle of the parcel, and then not have to apply that problem. App apply that restriction. Right. Yeah, right. I I I I just say that it's a problem that needs that needs to be resolved in order to make the the protection of the more protected parcel meaningful. I'm, I'm not picking how you do it. I guess I, I don't see a problem. The setbacks inside one zone are the distance that's appropriate between things in that zone. And the, the reason we have different zones is because there's different contexts where a different amount, different set of rules and apply. Well, you're you're assuming that you you you've noted many times in the past that the, um, the the coloring of the zones, the selection of the zones, was not entirely uh, based on what uh, boots on the ground. It was mostly based on an algorithmic interpretation. And you kept asking us, well, is there something you would change? Well, I'm going to propose that you would change it. This is a perfect example of somewhere where it should be changed. And one, one way you can do it is to draw the line down the middle of the zone, uh, sorry, the middle of those pink parcels. The other one, because presumably whatever's inside that green area is worth protecting. The other one is simply say, apply the protections of the green area, even though it's in the pink. Once it straddles the line. Toby's point, there's, it's an interesting point Toby's made. There's a border. Somewhere there's a border. The, the idea, I'm, I'm not looking at these in particular, but the idea that you would have a border between a more restrictive and less restrictive says that for the, the last parcel in the more restrictive zone is less like the ones that are in the center of it and more like the, the less zone. restrictive zone that it borders. Yeah, so it may be, I mean, I agree. I get what you're saying, Ted. In some ways, then, that where the border's happening is less protected than uh, all of the inner stuff. And, and in some way, you want to have it, you, you can't have it both ways. It, it is a border, but you, your, your point then, Ted, is you still want to be protecting what's in that more protected zone. I don't think it's possible. I think it's going to get too messy. And, um, and I also think there's something implicit there. Where the border is in some way, even though algorithms are imperfect, the the more restrictive zone that's at the border is more expendable or less less restrictable or for some reason it's not it's not at, it's it's closer to an area that's that's uh, got less restrictions. So it may not it, it may be appropriate that at its border the, the it, it, it's the, the parameters aren't aren't as effective because of that other property that's in the less restrictive zone. I, I mean, it may just be the way things ought to be. Well, do if you change the border, does if you change the border for another property, the bordering property doesn't, then the border changes and you got another problem. The next bordering, right? the next property is not bordering. And no, then the next no, one no, is no, bordering. That, that was Toby's that, idea. That was Toby's that, idea. That's, <clears> that's, a red, that's a red herring. And I'll, I'll point out to what seems obvious to me that these borders, for the most part, were not chosen 
uh, with conservation in mind or with protection of <clears throat> land in mind, but they were chosen by how the person who divided the property thought he could make the most money out of it yes, or, or, or other that. base reasons. Yeah. So there's nothing sacred about those lines. Well, now, the tax borders. The tax, the tax borders, borders of the properties, yeah, but and, not. And but in, the, the algorithm that David is using has a number of different aspects that are conservation oriented or conservation based. Exactly. Uh, exactly. That that would be true if his if the results of his algorithm drew lines through the middle of properties. So, for example, Bald Hill that we're, we were looking at it and still no, is on. Not, no, 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 no. It's a combination of two ideas. It's the tax maps and conservation. I agree. I mean, it, it would be nice if it looked like a contour map, if it was pure conservation. But uh, he had to work with parcels too. Right. So. Right. And yeah, that's why to, be, to um, be a devil's advocate, I think you could make just as much of an argument for allowing um, a less restrictive approach in the yeah. opposite direction. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of times a parcel is in the slope in, for example, rural one instead of rural two, because half of it has steep slopes. Yep. Should we apply the less restrictive rules of the less restrictive zone next to it to oh you, that's yeah. that's a that's a, a reasonable point, but the bottom line is we haven't done drawn these lines not the tax lines, but we haven't drawn the zone lines based on the boots in the ground. We did draw them based on tax reports. Yeah. And as, as such, if we're going to err, I think that we should err on the side of caution. So I would be happy to go to do boots on the ground and draw lines right through the middle, but not, you know, that isn't, the, that isn't easy. <laughs> well, you can't. I'm sure it's not going to be popular. So I'd rather. The major well, issue appeared to be the dark green, and the dark green is state forests and the parks. Yeah, I don't know why we want to split somebody else between there because it doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make sense. That 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 that's a subjective point. Uh, it does make sense from a certain point of view. Yes. The David. Yeah. So. <clears throat> And I'm sure, you know, we have, as David picked what I, what I think is a good example, we should perhaps look around for others. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sensitive to the, you know, not having seen these in, in boots on the ground way. Because, you know, a lot of what's pink is pink because it's presumably, you know, suburban in character already. Uh, well, well, it'd be nice to verify that with a, you know, drive-by. Right, well, take a look at Steam Mill Road. I'm, I'm sure we've all been up that once or twice. Yeah. Clearly the eastern side of Steam Mill Road, it, if you just look, if you ignore what's on the ground and just look at the dots and the property lines, clearly that's that's pink. Yeah. But, but when if you- If you drive you it, actually, it, doesn't feel, it doesn't feel suburban to me. It doesn't feel suburban at all. And that would be a, an, a good argument. That would be a, a place where I would say the right thing to do is to cut those parcels in 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 you know at some point, some distance from the road, or, or make don't... them or make them hatch green instead of pink. But... Well, that's what I mean. And cut cut them you know zone wise. But yeah. I don't I don't see cutting them into pieces zone wise as being a popular option. So the no, either. I think I would, I would rather just take them out and put them in another zone rather than. Right. That, but... I was going to actually ask Dave to do that because that's come up before. Okay, fair enough. But let, let's just for the sake of argument say okay, the backyards are steep. Yeah, right. Yes. So if if for the sake of argument, let's just say you didn't want to change the zone, the best way to protect that back lot is to apply the restrictions of the more restrictive zone to it. I think that's a very, very simple thing. And you look around, I'm not sure it's gonna hurt anybody. I think it's a lot easier to just change the zone than to say, yeah. oh, you're in this zone, but you don't use the rules in this zone. You use the rules from your neighbor's zone. Yeah, I agree uh, with Pat on that one. I mean, yeah, I mean we've got to have a boundary somewhere. That's what Toby said. You were, yeah. yeah. And not only that, I mean, for some of these, particularly for the, for the low density residential zone, I mean, the, the zones are so, so um, thin, so to speak, that they, they almost all the lots adjoin you know, a no. cut against an adjoining zone. Oh, yeah. So, that, you know, you, you're saying that, that there's no, there is no rules for this zone. All, only the adjoining one counts, you know. Right. Well, 
Well, and changing changing this zone wouldn't really affect subdivision because right. almost none of these lots can be subdivided. So you'd just right. be applying. In in today's different. pressures, they can't be, but let's no, just say No, they just that can't by the requirement of one lot for five acres. They have to be more than 10 acres to be right. subdividable and they're not. Right. And once you cast about and find one that can be subdivided, where there's a boundary between two ve two very different uh, sections. So if, as far as I'm I can sure tell, can this one. one is the only one that could be subdivided in this grouping. And that seems reasonable compared to the other ones around it for this one that to be sounds, split into two lots. Mm, no, well, no, that's the pond. The, I think that's... Um, that's uh, Joseph. That's Jonathan. Jonathan and, Jonathan and Beth. And Beth. Yes. Yep. There's with no the way pond. they're never going to With yeah. the pond. And so stuff. I know the folks. Yeah. Well, they might. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that, that's the only one that could be subdivided under these Very rules. Yeah. So if you applied another um, zones rules, if you applied the rural one rules, um, well, in, in this case, remember that that um, the pink is actually more restrictive than than the, the green. So that in, in this case, it's, it's a non it's a nonsense. Why don't you try to find a, a border between dark green and something where this occurs? Well, how about well, I don't think the dark applying the dark green to anything else makes sense because no. the dark green is all state land. Right. No, it doesn't make sense. Except for the, the and it was wasn't it Dave wasn't it decided that unless somebody wanted to be in the dark green yes. that we weren't going to put them in there exactly well, this is already well, this is already state for it but right right, yeah. right. And, and this is like people yeah when you this is uh, an argument that Rhonda has made that we should you know have a buffer of yeah. 100 or more feet around the state forest that no one can with a, a neighbor can't build anything within a distance of the border. And I think the discussion that we've had is that these large parcels are their own buffer. There's no real value in adding, adding 100 more. feet around yeah. a 100 acre parcel. It doesn't do anything. Um, well, take a look at Rhonda's parcel. Why don't you go down there? And see, let let's say that she she's an example of someone who volunteer, voluntarily wants to get at it. One little one little green block there. Yeah, that's yep. Rhonda right there. Uh, yeah. God, he wants well, to reason to apply it. Forget that it's Rhonda. Yeah. And forget that it's voluntary. Let's just assume. Uh, that wouldn't you want to draw a, a, a whatever it is hundred foot whatever however many hundred foot circle around that where it's protected? No. No, no, because she's done that no. voluntarily. You can't impose that on the on the neighbors. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> each, I mean, each, each person volunteers for their own property. You don't volunteer your property and your neighbor's property. I, if there was something special about that property and the surrounding property, right. like like you know, like we thought of uh, Butron Hollow and Pitching stuff, Hollow. then yeah. maybe yeah. we would do that. But it's not, you know. That hasn't been identified as as a really special place. So, oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's what else are we talking about here? <laughs> so there, there probably is a value maybe to do that for publicly accessed land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, my parcel would be an example. What would be the value? Um, well, I mean, if people go to public land and maybe they don't want to be a house right next door, right? They want to oh. hike a trail and not see it or something. So protecting vistas and things like that. So, so that, I mean, that that is something that has been proposed. Um, you know, Brad shouldn't be able to put his house where he wants on his lot because he's next to the state forest. And no one in the state forest should have to see his house from the state forest. Yeah, so publicly accessed land where Rhonda Unless the gypsy moths eat the trees. But... Again, then we're we're choosing to take somebody's property and put it in the green area, taking their choice away from them. In effect. 
us. It's only you. Well, not us. Some, uh, except in the case of voluntary dark greens. Well, I mean, if you're talking about doing it around the, 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 the state forest dark green, then you then it is us. We're, we're saying that yes. if you're within 100 feet of it, you're you're in it in effect. Yes. Well, that's bear right. in mind it's that private land. Bear in mind that we also deliberately avoided making things dark green, which were private property, in spite of the fact that they are steep slopes or otherwise, shall we say, bet areas that are best protected on their own merits, if you actually look at it, we avoided that. And so once again, okay, we avoided it, but let's see what we can do to protect them anyway. We do have the overlay zones which we haven't dealt with, you know, with the steep slopes and, and riparian corridors. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see, I think this cluster is another example. I don't see any value in applying the rules of either rural one or high density or high priority preservation to these lots. Uh, what you, it, it's that's sort of a there's a name for that for that type of argument. Those are undevelopable lot undevelopable lots in any case. What we need to do is find cases where this is meaningful and see is it worth doing there. So that's why I think you really have to look at the whole map and examine every case where that could happen. These are not these are not good examples. So uh, this the uh, issue of uh, the one Rhonda's where we said, suppose it isn't Rhonda, but if you look at hers, her house is very close to one corner of that lot. Yep. And then that would restrict the people next door. And they, you know, the fact that her house is next to the corner is not the people's fault next door. Um, so if you res put the restriction on them because her house is there, I mean. Well, the cluster the clustering that we're talking about effectively does the same thing anyway. If um, if the owner of the of the home to the uh, to the east to the right of Rhonda Square wanted to put a second house, that would be cl that would, clustering would apply, and whatever the distance is from Rhonda's house would restrict what they can do. We already have that sort of restriction built in. I'm talking right. about a, a different way to apply it. But you, you brought up her, but you did bring up her her uh, lot. So and no, what I'm saying and, is that in and it's not it's not entirely true, Ted, because that lot is what 65 acres. So they could divide it into six 10 acre lots, and then someone could just follow the setbacks and right. Build but, a lot. but as soon as they divide it, or uh, by our discussion from a couple of weeks ago. If they subdivide or put a second house on the same lot, then the cluster setback from an existing home applies. It's, we only already a have a, it's only a cluster if they want to go with the smaller lot size. If they go with right. at least 10 acres per lot, it's not a cluster. Right, right. No, no what, you, what you said last time, oh. and I'm sure it's on the video, was that if they want a second house on the same lot. Or on the same lot. On the same lot. Right, but if you or, subdivide it, it's not on the same lot. It's right. Or, right. or I'm, I'm finished the sentence. You said, or if they subdivide, as soon as that happens, that triggers the cluster provision. It could if the planning board required it. No, that's what it, he. That's what he said. It, it no. just triggers it. No, no ifs. So we already have that restriction no. built in. Ted, no, I think you you misunderstood what I said. Yeah. Uh, I didn't I, hear I, that. I asked, I asked you to repeat it several times to make sure that it was clear. And you said it was either of those two things. Sounds like a misunderstanding. Yeah, it's a misunderstanding. That's not how it works. If uh, you... then, then how, please... it, how it does work is, is, is still a little bit unclear to me. Um, in particular, I wish you, you, you could elucidate the, for me. You know, when, when we talk about, you've got in the table, you know, how many, how many total development rights can go in a lot. Are we talking uh, lots at the time that we pass this? Or, um, you know, if you've got 100 acres um, and you're entitled to, you know, 10 residential units, uh, are you 
what happens if you if you subdivide it into a couple lots? Is that then, um, so what, particularly with respect to the transfer development rights, does each one of those lots have the same uh, ability to tr transfer um, dwelling units in as the original parent pro property, or is it or is the parent property what defines how many can be transferred in? It's the parent property. So it's everything key. will be related okay. to when the when the zoning is adopted. Okay. If if I could bring up what I felt was an uncomfortable ending to the meeting last two weeks ago, I said that there was a way to subvert the intention of the um, cluster provision, and you're now saying that that is true. In other words, you're saying that we prevent you putting a second. You the cluster provision applies if you put a second house on the same lot. However, you can subvert that by simply dividing the lot. Is what you're saying. Because then the cluster provision does not apply. As long as the lot you're creating more than 10 acres. You have to have a 10 acre lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. But you have to have a 10 acre lot, which is divisible. Well, here's a case where you do, they do. So it can be subverted. What? It's not really subverted or not. It serves no. a different purpose. Well, it serves if a you, different purpose. Uh, the, the bottom line is you, if you cannot put a second house, if, if you're restricted as to where you can put a second house on that lot, because of cluster setbacks, and those and that restriction goes away if you actually subdivide it, then there is a way to subvert the cluster setback. And well, if you're being semantic, way, Ted. There's there's no difference between subverting I, if, subverting is applying a value statement. The cluster okay, setback is specific me. to clusters, and the other setbacks are specific to non-clusters. However, so, you stated last time. Uh, we, you've already gone back on what you stated last time, which was that there's no difference between oh two houses on one lot and dividing it into two lots. But if you now claim that dividing it into two lots means that the cluster setback does not apply, then the cluster setback will never apply because all somebody has to do is divide it into two lots. No, no, I now want to. <laughs> Only, only if they're willing to make the lots 10 acres or more. Yeah, right, right. We're talking about very large lots that are yeah. being created. Um, well, we're looking at one right here, I think. Sure, yeah. Uh, David, and, and, what, but this does bring to mind, you know, if you're going to divide a, a large lot like that into 10 acre lots, uh, is there a requirement for access that we haven't addressed yet um, right. in frontage? Right. Well, that's true. You've got to keep a lot of balls juggling in the air and we haven't defined some of the parameters. But you realize that the idea of multiple dwellings on one lot is something completely new. No. We've applied a restriction. It's not completely new. You can still get a permit. New. I mean, we've had, you know, yes, but it, right. what's, what's but new is the scope of it. Is, uh, the scope of it. But now what you're saying is, well, we're we've increased greatly increased the scope of multiple buildings on one lot and we've introduced a, a a cluster setback to prevent that from being becoming obnoxious to the neighbors but now that was unusual what they always used to do was just subdivide the lot well now they can and all of a sudden the protection you put in for the neighbors is gone just it's like not that. gone, Ted. The protection that was there for the neighbors in the past was you have to have an average of five acres per lot, and lots can be as small as two acres. Right. The protection right. that we're putting in in the future is that the lot has to be 10 or more acres. So depending on how you look at it, it's twice or five times as much yes. lot area that you're requiring. It's a much more rural um, type of development. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has yeah. to be 10 acres, but you're still allowed to build your property, what was it, 20 feet from your neighbor's property line. Mm -hmm. that, that is not what I would call a rural feel for someone like Rhonda, whose house is only how many feet from her property line? Less than that. So <laughs> I'm not sure well, what. Yeah, okay. You, thanks for blowing it up. Okay, so the owner of, let me just grab a annotation button here. Yeah, oh stay God. right there. Um, annotate and draw and the draw line. So you've got this property, which I'm assuming is much more than 10 acres. 
So the owner of this house can say, okay, I'm going to draw a property line. I'm just assuming that's 10 acres. And all of a sudden we can put a house right next to Rhonda. Okay. So I mean, right now Rhonda's house is 30 Rhonda. feet. Rhonda's house is 30 feet from the property line and the new rules would require the neighbor's house to be 50 feet from the property line. So that's almost a hundred there. Well, that's 80, 80, 80 so maybe it's out Jeez. there. So the neighbor is being required to do significantly more than the existing house has. Yes. I don't yes. see what the problem is. Right. Uh, in, wait, what is, there, what is it that they're doing more than the existing house? The existing house- The existing house is 30 feet from the property line and the new house would be 50 feet from the property yeah. line. Um, and the, I, hate to, I hate to put it this way, and your point is? No, oh my just God. Because they, just because whoever built Rhonda's house, I don't think she did, um, sorry about that. This thing won't let go of me. Clear it. Go away. You're talking with your mouth. Just because whoever built her house did what they did does not make it right for someone else or the next person to do something that's almost equivalent. No. Well, Rhonda's house makes a lot of sense given the location of the creek on that lot. Ah, okay, so now we know why it's done. In another place. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel that this is kind of an academic argument, and yes. I'm not sure we really have time for academic arguments. Every time we make this whole thing more complicated, oh. it's going to be a problem. And when we present this yes. to the town board and the town board starts deliberating, you know people are going to be coming out that weren't paying attention earlier, and they're, yes. they're going to find well. all these little complications that we're dreaming up or trying to apply and it's just going to cause problems. I mean, I, we have to proceed. I think that, I think Toby is absolutely correct. And that's why we should at this point, we don't have to do it during the meeting. You know, we can do stuff outside the meeting. We should look at all of these potential situations and say, okay, a neighbor is going to come out of the woodwork right here. So we ought to, we ought to make a decision that protects that neighbor to, to basically keep, keep them happy. But nobody has actually gone through, and the, David, pardon me if I'm incorrect, but nobody has gone through and done a case-by-case -case examination. It's all just been done on an algorithm, which may have been good or may have been bad, doesn't really matter, and various individual complaints or concerns that were raised by this group. But no one's looked actually looked at the whole thing. Actually, the dark green has been looked at because that's state forest and the park, that has been looked at. And your complaint has been about the dark green. So that has been looked at. Boots on the ground aren't going to help that. No, no, no. It has not been looked at. Those are simply the foibles of the property lines drawn in the past by the, on tax maps. Yeah. Nobody has actually looked to see what is over here versus over here. The Nobody's state looked forest? at it. The state forest doesn't have well-known borders. I don't. I don't know that. Do you know that? Yes, I, mean, I knew they did. I'm sure the. I'm sure the borders are well are well marked. Yes. Um, <clears throat> tell you. Tell you what. I know one guy who's who's surrounded by state forest. You shift over to uh, the um, southern end of Comfort Road, the very south. The, the map. Well, I can give. I can give you an example. Example of what? Um, of someone who, where you cannot tell the difference between the state forest and whatever's next to it. What? Probably talking about Lou's house. Exactly, Catherine. Very but, good. But, yeah, but I, I'm not agreeing with you. But I'm saying I know where you're talking about. Yeah. I don't know that he doesn't know. I, I mean, I, it's an assumption to oh, say I mean, he, he doesn't know. He knows, but you couldn't. You couldn't necessarily look at it and tell the difference. There may be a line on the map. But the trees are the same. Uh, we're talking about here. Oh uh, let me draw again in there. Yeah. There may be. There's clearly a line on the map, but <laughs> there is absolutely no difference between, let's say, th this portion of his property, and the uh, and the state forest next to it. No Except difference. that one is owned by the state and it's restricted reuse anyway. That's a big difference. Yeah, we, I mean, the state could log their part, and then it would be a big difference. But <laughs> yes, they're not going to be they're not going to be logging loose unless he's party to the process. Correct. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, they, not... they may be similar now, but there's no guarantee that they will ever ever be similar. 
I, I think we spent a lot of time on this and it doesn't seem like anyone else is really um, buying your concern, Ted. Um, I think we should- Actually, I think, I think Joel was buying my concern and I think he's more, more looking at it with a different solution. I, Maybe, I, yeah. I, um, you know, not, to conf not to confuse concerns and take, being willing to take action on it. I, I think even Jonathan was, was aware of my concerns. He just looked at it differently. Okay, yeah. well, I, I don't think that anyone is interested in spending more time talking about it. Yeah. Well, and we, 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 may, we may end up finding spots, you know, maybe there are five spots in town that that applies to, that there's an issue and, and there's nothing saying that over, you know, the next year or two or whatever that, that uh, you know, amendments yeah. can't be made. So I think we should move on. <laughs> Would anyone object to a, if not boots on the ground, at least a uh, map, a careful look at the map to find examples? Would you take action if there were, if those were pointed out? I don't think right now. I think this is- Oh, of course not you know, right now. I'm trying to take this offline so we don't waste time on it. So I- We I have to have boundaries a, somewhere. Yes, yes. There's, yes. An, there's an important distinction, um, Ted, because you're describing something as a problem and not everyone agrees with you that right. it's a problem. So right. finding examples of what is a problem to you Right. isn't necessarily a problem to everyone else. But if you want to find examples of lots you think should be zoned differently, you yeah. know, please okay. do. And, okay. and then Thank we can you. consider if they should be zoned differently. Thank you. And one of That would small... be my inclination would be to zone them differently rather than to be extend, you know, having the rules for an adjoining zone apply in another zone. Yeah. Whichever no, direction not, we're not going yeah, to be I'm, applying. I'm not. I'm not against that solution to it at all, if that's if that's feasible. But I, let me make one other small request. I certainly came out of the last meeting with a different understanding of the uh, rules of um, uh, the cluster when cluster is triggered than you are repeating today. So uh, whatever whatever you'd like them to be, put them in writing so that we can refer back to it. Right now, the only record we have is the video record from last, from two weeks ago. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't need all... to be script corresponding with the, you know, the, the concepts. But... Yeah, and, and I mean, obviously, if, if I have some time, I'll go back to that video record. I, I, I have made mistakes in my life, but I think I was pretty clear about that. Well, maybe, well, and, but maybe yeah, you I, get, I want to be clear that I don't want, <laughs> I don't want you to waste time, Ted. I'm describing the way it is. And no, no, it isn't. It's what's being, it isn't what the I, way it whatever, is. However you interpret what was said before, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter what was said before. If I misspoke, um, what matters is the way it works. Uh, well, excuse me, but if you misspoke several times, because I think I asked you to repeat several times to be completely clear about what you were saying, that then we went we went through the rest of the meeting making an assumption that wasn't true, and I could be wrong here. I'm not I'm not claiming to have a perfect. Memory, well, I mean, I, I don't I think there's much point in 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 focusing on whether you know David misspoke or not. Um, I think you know asking for further clarification where there's ambiguity or or un, uh, uncertainty regarding what might have been said might be worthwhile. Um, but but it's certainly no point in, in saying well did he or didn't he. The, what, as, as David said, you know, what, what, what matters is what's actually being proposed, not what he, what he, what he might have said about it that may or may, may, may not have been correct. Well, well as I, that, I, I agree. So, so this is an, it's, it's an important point. I mean, I think that the, I think it's I, worth, I, was, I had a question I was, that was similar, which is to say, in what, in what cases, uh, we, we, we've, we've divorced clustering from the cluster subdivision process. It's now possible to cluster on a lot without subdividing. Um, what's, uh, and then my question was, what's the legal framework for doing that? Because the, uh, when, when originally conceived, uh, it was, it was, I think a guy said, you know, we could, we could, we could justify this distancing with the, for the clusters using the cluster subdivision 
um, law, but when we're clustering without subdividing, then we're not using a cluster subdivision law as the legal basis for it. Which left me wondering what, what it maybe we could, maybe we could just make it up out of whole cloth because we're where we could cite, you know, municipal home rule and do it. But then I kind of wonder whether we aren't, don't have the same issues that he cited regarding, you know, what's happening on one lot affecting what happens on another lot. Yeah, so if I can jump in, Joel, I, I understand your question. I think you've asked it before. And the, the way that it works is it actually would use the subdivision process um, because the subdivision plat is where we are recording development rights um, so if someone wanted to use multiple development rights on a parcel, what they would do is do a subdivision amendment where they would amend their plat. So right now, for example, if you do a standard subdivision and you delineate a build and a no build area, if you wanna change that, you can change it through a subdivision amendment without cutting a piece off of your lot. You're doing the subdivision process, but you're not cutting a your lot into pieces but you're using the subdivision law to do so. The same process would apply if you wanted to um, cluster your development rights um, in a building. You would use the cluster subdivision process, even though you're not creating a new lot, you're amending the plat um, to delineate how and where those development rights are going to be exercised. Yeah, yeah, I recall this a similar discussion two weeks ago. That that I think that's what you did say. Yes. Well, it was. It just was. It just seemed to me that I mean, it was. Um, this is very interesting, and and I'm glad to see that we can do it. But um, it was it was totally it was totally foreign to our previous experience in the town. I thought. Okay. Does that answer your question, though? But um, it is a subdivision action. It's amending the plat and changing the way the plat is. Yeah, but that's you know that that might be hard to explain because you're calling it you're calling something which is not a subdivision, uh, a sub you know, an action under subdivision law. Yep, I'm actually doing an example of that right now. So you, if you remember the Melchin subdivision, the three lot subdivision that he just did. Yep. He only did a delineation on one of the three lots because he said, I don't know what's going to happen on the other lots. I don't know right. where they're going to want to develop. So the other two, two of the three lots were subdivided with the requirement that before you can get a building permit, you need to amend the plat and do the delineation process to decide what the build and no build areas are. And now I have buyers coming to me saying, you know, what is this process? I need to understand what we need to do. And that's what they need to do. They need to apply to amend their subdivision plat. And in that process, since it was a standard subdivision, they have to map the natural resources and delineate the build areas. Even though they're not changing the lot lines, um, they are making an adjustment to the adopted plat. So how is that different than site plan review? If it were mandated, it's, it's, be, it's because it was required under the subdivision. Gadfly. If you just put a house on an existing lot that's not made by a standard subdivision, you don't have to do that. If you subdivide one lot into two, you don't have to do that. The trigger is three or more lots in a standard subdivision. Three more dwelling units, you mean? I mean lots. It's the it's the subdivision that triggers that conservation um, process. But uh, there wouldn't be any subdivision if you were clustering on a on a lot. Right, because we're, we're talking about two different processes. Yes, right. Yeah, I I think that this Joel's puzzlement is an excellent example of why a written description of the cluster setback trigger mechanism would be very, very helpful to us so that we know exactly what it is. Yeah, of course. It will be in the zoning so that. Okay. Yeah. Right now, I think we're talking about something that's happening with the current subdivision law, the current law, and what we're, what you're talking about in this right. discussion is future. So the description is not going to apply after the new zoning laws. Right. Like 
what I'm saying is that we are now holding discussions which make which makes assumptions based on certain things, and we don't even know what those are. What is the actual definition of a cluster versus an ordinary subdivision? Because they're different from what we're used to. What we're used to is, is pretty simple, I think. All right, so let's... So is there any provision in your, um, so far for lot creation without the, the uh, inclusion of development rights? No, there is currently not. So that's um, where we are now. You can't create a lot without having it be developable. Yeah, and, and that is something that the um, Ag Committee had some concerns about. Um, So my problem with allowing the creation of lots that you say have no right to build a house on is that it's constitutionally problematic to deny someone a permit to build a house on a lot that they own. Um, Even if they bought it in the knowledge that it had lost its developability, if you will. I think so. I think it would be difficult, um, you know, and I, I guess I just am not sure there's really all that much need to have it. And we could roll the dice and try it, you know, if we wanted to put in there that someone can do it and somebody 20 years from now will have to deal with the fallout <laughs> from that. Oh, um, good idea. But, if, I could, if I could bring up the point that was raised during Monday's town board meeting, if I understood correctly, that's exactly the concern that Jay Franklin from assessment was raising, that you might subdivide a lot for conservation easement purposes, put a, a conservation easement on part of it, on a, thereby creating an unbuildable lot, perhaps yeah. a land. I think, I think it would be a very bad idea of the town to allow someone to put oh, a short-term short conservation easement on half of their parcel, then you're, you're just throwing away tax money at that point. I, I, I think you're absolutely correct. But so he was saying- I think Jay doesn't know our that. zoning and he doesn't know that we don't have to allow someone to do that subdivision. I, I agree. <laughs> but he, there it was someone who is at least reasonably close to the process, who's not a member of the public, could misunderstand that badly I think that you'll end up with arguments from others, but there it is. Okay. I, I'm not sure a good way to transition from this discussion, but I think we should transition to some yes. other discussion. I will not object. So with respect to lot creation, uh, oh my God. It, it's essentially divorced from clustering currently now, is it? Or you can cluster without creating lots. Sure. Yes. Or you can cluster, or, or you can cluster and create lots. Yep. Or you could create lots and not cluster. Right. You can Those, it. Now, when you create when you create lots, either way, whether you're, whether you're creating lots by clustering or or not clustering, what provisions do we have for access? Do we require frontage as we have in the past, or? Or, or, or do we um, allow for, you know, the minimum legal requirements for fire access, i.e. Yeah, 15 feet, uh, somehow getting onto a public way? Yeah, yeah. So the current proposal does not have any frontage requirements. So the only requirement would be width to, that's required by state law. Okay, so there's no, requir there's no frontage requirements in any of these zones? except the low density residential that we said would say the same. Okay, so what's to prevent uh, the road frontage all getting built up? I think it'd be pretty hard with 10 acre yeah, lots. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, except they don't have to be 10 acre lots. They could be, they could be, the lots could be smaller. They can be as small as you'd like. Only, uh -huh. only the overall density is 10 acres. So, I mean, if you've got a hundred acres, why wouldn't they all pull, why not? pull them all to the road frontage. 10 acres or less than two acres. So they'd all end up being two acre lots. 
It could be, yeah, there could be two acres or acre and a half, but you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but there wouldn't be any requirement for road frontage for those, so there could be, they could be, you know, there's no separation distance. So that's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to keep all the road frontage from being built up. But, but then the problem was that we couldn't have one lot, what happened on one lot affected what happened on another lot. So, so but by, by taking the road frontage requirement out altogether, we are allowing lots to have essentially driveway access. Uh, and it could be side by side by side, you know, but. Um, Would it be fair to say, Joel, that your vision, what your fear at the moment, is that every large lot would get broken up into the maximum number of two acre lots, leaving the rest with big field behind it, and you'd have high density along the road? Yeah. And I'll, I'll add, let me add to that just a little bit. There's also the possibility, since we haven't really talked about this yet, of creating what we today call a flag lot. Yeah. And, and once, you hit, once the prevalence of flag lots right behind existing lots increases, then all of a sudden the very small setbacks that we've enacted, for example, a front yard of a flag lot is, is is right behind an existing house. And all of a sudden the front yard of 10 or 20 feet does not make so much sense. I, mean, I wonder whether it isn't even worse than that. And that I, I wonder if the front yard of a flag lot isn't the first 50 feet of the driveway. Your concern is even stronger than mine. So, I mean, the, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, doing that in terms of how much space behind gets preserved, but the result is still, um, it's, it's very suburban on the ground. You know, it's the difference between, well, there, 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 there are parts of town where you, you, you can drive and, and, and in particular where it's forested, and you have the same development density, which is one house every 200 feet, but the houses are set back so far that it still feels rural as you drive down the road because you don't see the house. But if that's the major so, concern is that don't see the houses from the road and we, we wipe out all the uh, flat areas from other places, is that better? Why is that better? Yeah, and I, I'm gonna interrupt because I think this is a good transition to my little presentation here that I prepared for Russ, but he's not here to see it. That's okay. And to be another way to do driveways. I mean, we do have these these criteria for locating that says, you know, we try to avoid um, putting them on the street, but. Yep. All right. So we're going to talk about what has more rural character. We're going to look at some example lots. Um, and each slide is going to be a street view and an aerial view yeah. of the same lot. Cool. And we can think about whether or not it feels rural or not. And we can think about the setbacks and how, and the siting and how it feels and how much land is useful and preserved. So this is the first one. Do you guys see both screens? Is that obnoxious? Uh-huh. I only see one. I see I both. I no, see I both. both screens. Oh, now I, now oh, I those... only really, really see the left-hand one. Okay. And that's good. That, All right. That's not so good. This is one screen, right? This is one screen, yeah. Yeah, yeah you you blow it and make sure it's not my fault. Okay. Oh, I know where that is. Yep. So a bunch of these are on Yaple, which we've discussed Yaple a lot. Um, so this one is right at the end of Yaple. And it's a small house that's very close to the street. It's very well hidden. Um, and all of the back lot is forested, has an old barn on it. This is a nearby new lot that has almost a 300 foot setback. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Is this more rural than the other lot? No, no, um, no. Next example. No, sir. This is Toby's house. I asked his permission to make sure he's okay with us using it. <laughs> No, this is a good example. Yeah. The historic farm house and barns that are right on the road, but also very well buffered but with screen. landscaping. Yeah. 
and right. maintained, you know, the continuity of the land behind it um, as usable. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. yeah, to be fair, bear in mind that this is deciduous foliage. There are six mm -hmm. months a year where the situation is very different. Well, it's pretty oh, dense no. deciduous foliage. It's pretty dense yeah. deciduous vegetation, though. He could have used conifer. He could have used non-deciduous, not conifer. Right, but but it, it's not what he could have done. He, these are examples he's showing us, and they're only valid six months of the year. So, That's okay. That's so, all right. Yeah, with me. What, what, I think what's really valid here is I'm asking. We're thinking about what is rural character, yes. and I think a lot of the discussions that we've had have said that. 90% of the historic farmhouses and farms in Danby are not rural character. Um, well, no, it's I, not that. It's just that you, know, you have a cluster, and this is a classic example, you know, multiple farm buildings very close to the road. That was very typical in, in the early development pattern. But there would have been hundreds of feet of open, undeveloped land between such clusters. It's very different when you line the road with those things. Well, the, I think the question is, how do we get or protect ruralness. Yes, um, yes. Yes, yeah. And, and so the, the question is, do we make this illegal and require this? Does that help? No, it doesn't help. I mean the worst no. case the worst case scenario is a house in the field where you can where, where you can see it. So yeah. Whether it's whether it's on whether whether that house is on the street, you know, yes. 30 feet back from the road. Or, or 600 feet, well, maybe not 600 feet, but you know, 300 feet back from the road is, 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 is not much of a mitigation when you've got an open field between it and the road. But so the issue is not an open field, it's whether you can see it, but I'd rather not put it yes. in the open field whether I can see it or not. I agree. Um, right. And so we, there, there ought to be a way to, you know, tuck them in the edges of the field at least. Well, well, well that, actually, that actually brings up a discussion we had 10 years ago, Joel, you may remember the idea of, um, some kind of mitig visual mitigation, whether it's yeah. birds, trees, right. bushes. In other words, what Find these pictures illustrate to me is that if there is something between the house and the road, such as Toby's bushes or, or whatever's going on here, that's much more rural feeling, much more visually attractive than your big open lot with a house at the back of it. Yeah, I agree. I, it's agree. Not the I think it's probably we'll all agree. Yeah, and I think back then we were talking about some kind of, it's not gonna apply here, but we were talking about some kind of credit system that will allow you more flexibility if you provided that visual mitigation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in agreement about this. The, the, my, my concern would be that, that that previous example where we had the house 300 feet back, what app, what's to keep there from being five houses in that view? instead of one. Nothing if you can buy the development rights. Yeah, which is what you wanted. <laughs> well, I, mean, I assume I, that was the royal you. <laughs> it, well, you know, we, we, there's, there, in, in terms of the overall development density, clustering is to be preferred to sprawling. And combining into one building is better than having separate houses on, in the same place. So that's sort of a general principle, I guess I'd say that I would, I would, I would say that's probably true. But part um, of what you've said, Joel, has to do with closeness to the road. And uh, I think that part of what David's presenting here, I mean, our house is another example, just coincidentally, where there's no fragmentation. It's, it's a longish driveway, but it's, it's a driveway that goes in a short distance and then cuts 90 degrees following the wood line. So there, there's, there's a wood line. So all of these possibilities of several houses along a roadside could be, if you want to use the word mitigated as Ted has, that's fine, but it's just a matter of design. And, and oh, I'm not yeah, sure how you legislate that. I'm not sure Site how you plan. legislate it, but there's no Site reason plan. to, you, you don't say um, having lots of houses along the road is always gonna ruin rural character because yes. it obviously isn't. You can design yes. to, to keep things woodsy looking. I'm gonna use that word. Uh -huh. I think you're right oh. that, 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 that the, uh, as you say, you know, it's a lot, I think Catherine's made this point multiple times too. It's a lot easier to hide houses in the woods. Yeah. Well, yeah, but at the same time, if you go down further on Yaple Road, yeah. uh, 
there's another house down there where the people have put uh they've let the roadside grow up um it's um i think it's might be scott adams house but i'm not sure which one is down down on the going away from toby's it's on the right yeah. and they let a lot of stuff grow up by the road i mean it, and the and um yeah. the guy across from toby's house that field was wide open it's been wide open and me and mowed the whole time and you can't all of a sudden tell him he suddenly has to plant a bunch of trees right right well That's actually right. i think we can tell him he has to plant a bunch of trees or don't put the houses on well i'd like to be able to say you know don't put the houses on on the on the road frontage when it's a field but that's no. the problem. Well, that's, just, that's the problem. Not on the road frontage. It's I, way back. I don't have a problem with the road frontage. So no, that, I don't either. We that's your opinion, Joel. We're going mean, to argue the, about that. The issue is fields. The cows come home. Yeah, we are. But um, there's lots of ways to hide houses. Well, uh, just, and it's it, all you know. We get back to the rural character. Is it is rural character based on what you see from your car, and and I the hell with the metal lock and the bobbling. I say. I, I would disagree with that. Um, yes. No, I wouldn't say it's 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 not limited to what you see by from your car, but but what you see from your car does have a major Impact. effect on whether or not it feels rural or not. There's lots of ways to have the house closed. I don't know. Maybe maybe um, David was going to do a, a bigger presentation than what he's done so far. And I um, think it maybe. But there's lots of, of there's lots of ways um, whether. You know, we give people incentives or site plan. That there's lots of ways to mitigate people's views from their car. Could, could Allow me just, to throw to throw an idea out there. Ted, could, um, could somebody else talk? Could 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 we just let some other people, including me, say something? Go go right ahead. But I thank have you, a point. Thank I'd you. Like to okay. Thank you. For instance, um, the guy across from Toby. I can't think of his first name, but anyway. I said his first name, but that's all right. Anyway, please let me say this. He, when that house was put in there, we could have said, you can't build a house that looks like that. We could have said, you have to build a house that looks rural in a big field. We could have, but we can't do, you know, after a while, it, it becomes a bit, it's, it's telling everybody what they can or can't do is probably going to be a bigger argument than deciding whether it's bad to have a, a house right next to the road. For instance, Toby's house does look rural because it is farmish. You know, there's that. So, mm -hmm. you know, these, there's styles. Looking at mm -hmm. Julie and Tom's house is, is, you know, they did not develop the front of their property and they've let it all grow up and their neighbors might not like it because everybody else has grass lots. Yeah. You know, we're getting into right. dictating what people do with their, not only their, where they plant a house on their property, but what it looks like. Yep. So it, it, it was a big shock when that house went in there yeah. and the style of it. But how do you tell people that, you know, if you want to tell them they have to plant trees, good luck, unless we're going to buy them for them. Yeah, our neighbors, uh, they like that house. And I think a yes. lot of a lot of other people do as well. And you That's can't right. really deny that. That's I actually right. like it. Yeah, and, it, and they're, they're nice and they take pride in mowing it and keeping it. So, you know. so I, I think it's worth considering um, with Yaple Road, what would be different under our different proposed rules? Um, yeah, that how, would be good to know. If if it was all one lot, and I don't know if this was all related to the farm that Toby lives in now, but uh, for the sake of argument, let's say both sides of the street were all part of that farm as one parcel, and it was in the rural one. Um, they would there would be allowed to be half the number of parcels, and the houses could be closer to the street. And there would be site plan review for the siting of each of those houses. Or they could cluster them and they could put them all in one or two buildings on one of these lots and all of the rest of it would be left intact. 
and that one or two parcel would be more dense and the rest would be much less dense. And that would also have site plan review if it was in the rural two or one, sorry. If it was in the rural two, they have approximately the same amount of development potential. They have the same development options, um, but there's only site plan review if it's multifamily for more units. More, more than four units, right? And um, if it's a cluster, it has to be set away from anything that's existing. But if they wanted to make the cluster down here and then preserve all the rest, that would be possible. I think both of those are far preferable. Even if it was just developing it at 10 acre lots and they put the houses right on the road, you'd have half as many houses. That's right. Maybe that would, um... Well, of course, because you don't have much depth there. I mean, you've got you've got a lot of road frontage relative to the depth. Uh, the 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 more problematic cases where you've got a lot of depth and not much road frontage. Because then, when you pull the pull the houses to the road frontage, they they end up they can, they can end up fairly close together. Right, but if you're making if you're clustering and making lots, then you have site plan review on that process. You know, the, and, the then, and you have up. those criteria that, 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 that includes, you know, avoid um, visibility from the road if you can. Yep. yep. Uh, interestingly, the developers at the time felt they were doing a good thing by maintaining the large lots. I, in 93, I don't know if that did that avoid uh, site plan review, Joel, yep. back then? Yeah, these, could, yeah. These, these are lots by permit. Okay, and then they donated this strip of the power line to the state park. Is that what happened? Is that yeah. what the green? That's what the green strips about. Yeah. So uh, it's just interesting, but you know, at the time, or it took a few years. That's clearly what the market was was after, was that sort of lot. And you know, I, it remains to be seen how long it will take for this clustering to really catch on. But it's it's a great idea if people go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the market right now, and, 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 you know, and it could be some time before it changes, is people who want their quote place in the country, and they're going to want, they're going to want five to 10 acres that they could put their house in or on. Uh, and so the probability is that when lots are created, that's what we'll get. Um, and that, now we're saying that in R1 and R2, those lots, if you're going to do them one at a time, are going to be 10 acres. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty big. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know it's uh, that that in itself mitigates a lot of the potential. Since a moment of silence may I break in with the idea that I had before or the thought. If you can if you compare the lot that um, David showed us that corner lot with the house set back in, in back of an open field. Just imagine that it is bigger, a bigger field than it is. It's really about a six and a quarter acre field. I, I did a little measure. And, and picture your field stone circle, which is a cluster of houses on a big open area. The difference is that field stone circle is not open. You don't mind how many houses are back there because you just can't see them. From the main road. And the same the thing's main... true of Old Town Village. And... Same thing's true there. So imagine this field at the corner of Yaple and King. You could, you could say, look, if you want to develop this, you could actually put in as a required thing. If you want to develop more than one house, one house is pretty bad. <laughs> but if you want to put three houses on that lot, which you couldn't because it's, well, maybe you could, it's, it's in the pink. But if you, wanted to put th if you wanted to put three houses there, you would be required to put in a, a row of trees along the road, two rows of trees to make sure you can't see it. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what the planning board can do in site plan review. Yeah. Well, that's what they can do if we, if we give them the power to. I, that's I what would... That's what the, I would tend to think that we should go further than that. Well, that's what that last column is about. Excuse me? That's what that last column is about. Uh, which column? 
in, in David's table, the one that talked, oh. about, talked about site plan review being required or not. Well, and one the of the things David said at the beginning was that the first I, item on whether we need to talk about now is review parameters for site plan review. Yeah, and here it they seems are. Seems like that's what we should be doing now. That would be that would be fair. So there, so in fact, we can. I think we should not write it as an option, but that they must do that if they intend to go beyond one house or maybe one. I'm not, I'm, I'm not. Well, you know, the thing that. is though that these are, these are all desirable, but they're not necessarily all possible on any particular right. lot. Right. So that's, that's why, what site plan, why review is about. site plan review criteria that the planning board will be entrusted with enacting in a sensible way for each individual parcel. Because we can't, um, we can't just write a set of rules that will work. With well. the understanding that our, we have had limited experience with site plan review in Danby over the last decade. And the experience we have had, generally there have been not too much in the way of requirements. True, but the, um, the criteria are not so clear either. Yeah. That, yeah, list right that may be the case, uh, but I, I still remember that short, that guy who pled poverty on the short driveway at the corner of Beardsley. Yes. There was neither poverty nor an excessive expense involved. Nonetheless, he made the argument and the planning board accepted it. Yep. You know, it, it's the you know, site plan review is a discretionary process. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to go to the planning board. You could just say, you know, these are the rules. So why don't we why don't we talk about the proposed rules for site plan review um, that the planning board would be able to implement in a flexible way that makes sense parcel by parcel. The first one is driveways should be shared when possible, and new road access points should be minimized. Mm -hmm. Clustering of development rights is encouraged. Clustering of lots may be required by the planning board. That's already part of our zoning. Um, I don't know of any time it's been used, but I think it would be good to reiterate that yeah. power. What, what's different is the, uh, the ability to cluster without subdivision. Yeah. Um, new development should be minimized on class one and two soils. New development should be hidden or screened from the road and neighboring properties when possible. Attached multiple dwelling units are preferred over separated dwelling units. Views should be protected and impacts on views should be minimized or mitigated. New development and new lots should be arranged to minimize fragmentation of existing contiguous fields and habitat. And parking for more than four vehicles on a lot should be screened from view from the road and from neighboring properties. Um, yep. A question for you, just so I'll understand how you intend those to be applied. That corner lot that you showed us on Yaple Road. Yeah. Apply these rules to that. Would they have, would they have made any difference? Absolutely. Uh, they could have been required to put the house behind the barn where you wouldn't see it and it would be more in the corner in the trees instead of in the middle of a field. Well, it's not act it's actually uh, located in the southeast southeast corner of the field, very much so. Uh, well, almost to the point probably of the setbacks that we required. So it, it is actually cited in a very reasonable way. So I'm going to share my screen, my map again. Yeah, I don't know where the property line is, but they are at the southeast corner of the field. So they actually own both parcels. Would so they're in the middle of this, um, but they could have been sited back here where you wouldn't be able to see it from the road at all. Be hidden by, this is trees, this is the historic barn. If, you, if the house was sited in this part of the lot, um, it would, have much, <laughs> it would have much less visual impact um, on the neighborhood and it would preserve more usable field area. Yeah. And it would have a shorter driveway and less uh, impervious surface and all of the issues that come with that. Right. Uh, I'm looking at the Google, Earth, uh, Google satellite view 
and in fact, the house uh, is, it could have been closer, but it is very close to the tree line, which is within the property boundary. It's, uh, it's sure you as you can see, it's almost halfway up. Um, let's see, I think I have my, uh, my line there. The tree line is something like this. Oops, not, not seeing it. Right, so what I'm saying is that if the house were placed here instead of here, it would disturb much less land and it would be less visible from the road and it would have less negative impact on the rural character of that part of the community. Yep, yep. it would. No doubt about it. If I were the homeowner, I wouldn't want it there though. They picked the best, the best from the homeowner's point of view. They have picked the best spot that they could. Yeah, their drainage issues as well. Uh, Is it wet behind wet the barn? They are. Yeah, it's very wet. So there's always going to be things to consider, um, but th that is the process of considering those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just for fun, the uh, barn there uh, w was moved from the Bald Hill community. Really? Oh, huh. oh interesting. So the two lots that you showed include the entire wooded area, the L-shaped wood, wooded area. Uh, no, there's a border between the adjoining property and the woods. Um, according to, let's make sure I get this right. Yeah. I'm going to move forward because I don't yes. think there's any use in yeah. debating right. the particulars of this site. What matters is the process of review and what options they would have. Yeah. There's options in, to come it, to a better. Comparing. Uh, wait, oh. You're on mute. So, David, I mean, the house, the next house, that's an interesting comparison. I mean, mm -hmm. look at they've, they've, um, instead of having the driveway go straight and end at the house, it's curved. Mm -hmm. So if you are driving by there and you look down the driveway, you don't see the house and they've planted trees along the road. So, mm -hmm. and look how close that is to the road. I, it's mm -hmm. just, that would have been a nice Nice option. That's our house. <laughs> That's not our house. That's the way our house is. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. And I, I think if, if they were required to do uh, another layer of trees, then you wouldn't be able to see it at all. I think as it is, right. my recollection is that it's still pretty visible and mostly looks like a lawn with some stuff in it. Right. But... The trees aren't very big. Yeah. yeah. But well, they, could have, they could have put in bigger trees. Well, they grow fast. In 10 they years, the right they'll, they'll be big. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those are, those are the kinds of things that the planning board would have in their um, arsenal. And I get, I, my question is, those are the proposed ones. Does anyone think that any of those shouldn't be there or that there should be any other specific ones that they would like to suggest? I would like to, I've been trying to find some information on uh, lighting at night, mm. and exterior lighting, and I'd uh -huh. like them to pay attention to that. And um, mm -hmm. I haven't had much luck coming up with very specific, but yeah, dark sky. Uh, so I guess that's a It's not a zoning issue really, but right? Yeah. What did you say, Carol, Joel? I would say that's not really a zoning issue, but yeah, sure. It's it actually in a lot of zoning. Um, it, I guess my question is, if the town wants to require dark sky compliant exterior lighting, really, my suggestion would be like adopt that as a local law for everywhere, rather than just as a site plan review requirement. I you know why? I don't see any reason why you ever wouldn't want it unless you know you wanted to have an out for. You know, people should be able to have whatever kind of lights they want on their own house. And it's only when you do something bigger that that should be triggered. Um, there are towns that do it both uh -huh. ways, that have dark sky requirements in all zones or in some particular zones or only for large projects um, or for all projects. So um, I would like to point out that um, that 
the business of planting trees along the road may work for Yaple Road, particularly since the that's a town road and um, we can work with the town to arrange that to happen. But on a road like South Danby Road, where they run the wires, the utility wires, and the utility, particularly on my property, claims more than 30 feet of road, of frontage maintenance. And they absolutely do not want me planting trees. It, it gets a little, it's very difficult to do anything in on your front property, no matter how many feet you have. And I would really like to see us somehow be able to, to change that whole perception from the utilities. But I have one maple tree and they've threatened to take me to court over it uh, because it's high enough that it now goes through the utility wires and, and they falsely are claiming that it's creating outages on the road. And so, it's th that whole business of not being allowed to plant any vegetation in the front is a big deal for me. Yeah, we can't do anything about that with zoning though. Um, yeah, we can, yeah, and we did talk about it the last meeting. I remember it was this meeting or, the, or this group or the Hamlet group uh, talking about requiring utilities to be buried on new roads so that you wouldn't have those constraints of you know running into overhead wires and then having the utility trying to trim your trees and not allowing you to plant trees near the wires. Actually, I think we, we actually talked about just requiring it all new development, not just new roads. Well, I could yes, be you're wrong. saying like with well, the cluster, same thing, right? Basically what you're saying. Right. You know, yep. even, yep. New, even just plain old new driveways. Uh, I'd like to just point out that Kevin can't talk to us, so he's put some comments into the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for bringing up something specific in the table for us to talk about. Yeah. And well, Kevin pointed out that you know, some people like to orient to a view. Yep. And, and pointed out that sometimes that puts them in existing residence view. Right. Um, Absolutely true. And, and 14 is, says, says when possible. It's not, it's not insisting on a screen. Well, because what do you mean by possible? If, if, you, if it can be done, then it's, then it's possible. Well, that's true. To, to take Kevin's point, to illustrate Kevin's point, when I asked the question about that corner property on Yaple Road and whether what would have happened if these rules were applied to it, I think that the the homeowners <laughs> these rules would be, have been a showstopper for them. What does that mean? They wouldn't have bought it. Uh, they wouldn't have built it. I, I hope they wouldn't have had the, the they wouldn't have bought it, but they would have really not they built it precise for their needs which haven't been the best for the neighbors especially the lighting but that's they built it for their needs not and had the zoning said you can't do that a they would have been angry but b they might not have done it which wouldn't have been such a terrible thing would it Value judgment, Joel. <laughs> well, we're, this is all about value judgment. Yes. Well, we, value. You, you've already you, earlier the argument was that we shouldn't impose our values, and now you're saying we should. I, I'm not. I, I don't remember ever making that statement because that's certainly not the case. I mean, we, zoning is all about imposing value judgments uh, in the interest of the common good. Yeah, not not necessarily you, Joel. I had I had a I was proposing something that apparently was only limited to my values. Well, yeah, we do, have to, we do have to find what we're collectively willing to support in the interest of, you know, common good. Oh, yeah. And it, oh, yeah. it, may, it probably will not be, you know, pleasing to everybody. It's almost guaranteed not to be. Yes, anyway, I think, I think Kevin is making an excellent point in there that it, when we impose those values, we are in fact putting very stiff restrictions on what some people might want to do. 
Right, we're constraining I'm making, them. I'm not making the value judgment of good or bad. I'm just saying we are doing it and we better yeah. face up to it. No question about it. Yeah, well, I think we've been clear that there is a value judgment that is widely shared, which is that we do not want um, to perpetuate the suburbanization of candy. And then the question is, are we willing to do something about it? And how much? To which I remind you what Joel said earlier, the rules as we're proposing them are going to turn large lots into lining the roads with small with small lots. Well, David had a pretty good rebuttal, I thought, in, 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 in talking about how, given the density that we're dealing with, there's a limited ability to do it. Uh, and uh, and the um, and the site plan requirements are are allow for mitigating those impacts. So it's a bit it's it's pretty clear from what David said that it would have played out differently had these rules been in place, uh, and that the the kind of development that's 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 allowed, the density that's allowed would result in something which would be rather differently laid out probably. And, and, it's, and it's only a question of, is, is it, is, if, you, if you max that out, if you do it, is it still feel mostly rural? And it, I, I think it can be done in a way that, that does still feel mostly rural. I agree with you, it can be done, but and yeah, I would argue that any done. way that you do it under the proposed rules would feel more rural than what we have there now. Right. That's easy, but that's not. But but well, what we have here now, we, we all agreed was 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 a catastrophe. I don't think everyone agrees that it's a catastrophe. Well, most, <laughs> but right. Well, I thought for years it was a catastrophe. It was it was a widely held opinion that it, you know the the, the the we were we were. <laughs> Headed down the road of simply suburbanizing Danby, had we not done something significantly different, mm -hmm. and I think this is significantly different. Yeah. Um, in regards to number fourteen that, that Kevin has pointed out an issue with, could you just rephrase that? Uh, it it uh, if you look at I think it's nineteen where it says parking for four or more cars. Yeah. It is is a, a little more insistent or definite. Uh, if you could sort of toggle back the 14 and say uh, when when practical or something, just a slightly different wording. Well, turn it into unless impractical. How could it be impractical? I need a fence. Well, in general, if we really want something to happen, we should not say if it can happen. We should we should use the words, unless it's impossible. Well, what if, if you had a landscape architect that could, using a, just a few trees without obscuring a view completely, effectively create a visual barrier? I mean, I, I think there's solutions. I know most people don't hire a landscape architect when they're building a house, but <laughs> unfortunately, but... Uh, yeah, I think there should be a little flexibility on that. But I mean, the planning board has some flexibility, don't they? It's sure. uh, it's not legislation. It's it's guidelines. guidelines. Right. Well, the, cho the choice of specific words in the rules makes a big difference to what the planning board can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Words are very important. That's true. So the planning board with the current rules would certainly have the ability to turn down an application if they proposed a way to screen it and the applicant refused. Um, I think the, the question I'm hearing is whether or not we want them to do that. Um, and it, I think it's relevant if someone said, you know, it's not possible for me to screen because then I won't be able to see the things that I want to see from my new house. How do we balance that? It's not, that's not a possibility. It's not that they can't do it, it's that they want. Don't want to. Right. 
Um, I can't do that screening. And, you know, it would really be up to the planning board to decide how much was reasonable and what is most important to be screened um, from who is receiving that screening, who is it benefiting. You know, they might decide that they, no one can see it or, or maybe the neighbor comes and says, I don't really, it doesn't bother me. I, I have screening on my property. I can't see the house. Um, you know, there, there would be some flexibility there. And I, I think somebody, Toby pointed out that you could screen it well from the road um, in a way that doesn't totally impinge on the view. So I think there are options here. And the question is, I think Kevin has pointed out that he, do, he doesn't think these are good values, um, that, we sh that we shouldn't be making it a priority, that um, essentially, I think a fair way to be to describe this would be privileging existing owners over future owners. You're saying that the people who live there now are entitled to not having to see or having the view change minimized on other people's property. Well, I think I think you're implying though that the only people who are affected by it are the ones who live in the proximity. Uh, it affects everybody else who who drives by. So they, you know, in other words, the, the impact is not limited to the, you know, it's just because just because one neighbor doesn't object doesn't mean that it's not gonna affect the rest of the, the, the feel of the neighborhood and how, how others perceive it. Yep, yeah. that, would, that is up to the planning board. Um, but you are essentially saying that the, in that case, the feelings of existing residents who might drive by are more important than the feelings of the new resident. Yeah, I think that would have a severe impact on whether people would want to build here at all. I don't think that's the goal of this. I didn't think so. Um, I don't, well, I don't, I wouldn't say that's the goal, but although the goal is to minimize um, building up the low density areas of the town and focusing development in the hamlets, Making it harder to develop in those areas and easier to develop in the ham in the hamlet. So saying, well, gee, we don't want to constrain people unnecessarily. They might not build there. Well, don't. Uh, we'd rather they didn't anyway. Whoa, we wouldn't have moved here. <laughs> I know that we'd be impoverished without you, Pat. But um, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't care. I know. <laughs> we wouldn't know what we were missing. So, you know, we've had, Kevin is suggesting that we remove some of these um, site plan review parameters. Um, and I think I've um, described his argument um, fairly, and I, I think it's a reasonable argument, but now we have to decide, do we as a group agree with it or disagree with it? Um, and um, Kevin, I don't know if you, if there's anything else you want to add, but I think it might be useful to kind of walk through, you've suggested um, tossing 14, 15, and 17. Maybe we can walk through those one at a time and hear from the group. Can you put them back up? What, Ted? Can you put them back up so we can see the wording? Yeah. Please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. Please. Graciously. Jeez. Okay, 14. Is that sharing the, yeah. I'm not getting my outline, there it is. We got it, we got it. We got it. All right, so 14 is new development should be hidden or screened from the road and neighboring properties when possible. Um, so I think it's a totally <laughs> fair characterization of this that that is saying that the views of people going by or the views of existing neighbors are more important than where somebody wants to put their house. I would argue it's also part of the comprehensive plan if the comprehensive plan is saying that that is part of what defines rural character. I'm not saying I agree, but it's not, this is a value that sort of transcends, it's sort of penumbric. And it's when possible, it's not saying you have to. Yeah. So, I, I think it might be fastest to deal with this to just um, for each one okay. say if anyone else would like to 
remove or reduce uh -huh. that requirement. Um, so yep. I'm gonna hold space open for that for number 14. Right. Does anyone else want to remove or reduce the strength of number 14? I would like to remove the word hidden and say it should be screened from the road the yeah. neighboring properties when practical, but I realize that's vague. But hidden uh, seems too strong. And, and what worries me yep. is, is that totally. many people, I mean, frankly, can just afford a double wide. I mean, mm -hmm. you, and uh, in a small lot that's parallel to the road and uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And you could put a bunch of those in, then you end up with suburbia. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Or a tr suburbia doesn't have too many double wides in it. And um, if, I, I'm not sure uh -huh. that the comprehensive plan says you can't have, uh, the goal is not to have many houses on the road. Is that explicitly in the comprehensive plan? It's the rural character idea. Yeah, yeah I don't think there's anything that specific in the comprehensive no, plan. Not at all. So it doesn't say what rural character is, which means uh, there's... we spent the better part of a year arguing over that. Um, right. <laughs> but 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 the bottom line is, I mean, it is related to density. It, it, at some point, you know, the, the density of houses is such that it's not rural. Yeah. So that's um, fourteen. I, taking like... away hidden is a good idea. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And changing the word possible to feasible or practical, as as Toby said, something yeah. like. Okay. So I'm hearing, I think, three people saying they like the idea of removing hidden and changing when possible to when practical. Um, is there anyone who, who does not like that? I don't. <laughs> uh, else? Joel, what reasons for not liking it? Um, because you know, it, to, the, to the extent that it is hidden, it, it uh, minimizes its impact on uh, reducing the rural feel of it. So, you know, where, where the houses are hidden, um, it still feels rural, even if they're fairly nearby. If it's overburned behind, a, you know, in an in a evergreen planting or whatever. I mean, I got them over, got them on this side of the hill because we have such rolling topography. I mean, there's houses that are just over the knoll. You don't see them. It, it might as well not be there. You can't tell. Yeah. So I think this is a this lot that we looked at first in the slideshow is an example of what I would describe the difference between hidden and screened. And yeah, this, is, this is screened but not hidden, right? Yeah. The problem with the word hidden is that it's an absolute term. Well, it should be hidden. And it doesn't say it has to be hidden. Yeah, it should be hidden when possible. It's when possible. It has adequate flexibility. The question is, what is our goal? Well, and so it sounds our, like some people are saying that the Screening is enough as long as it's you know this kind of treatment is enough. Um, and would you know, be people... more specific about the screening? I don't really feel that this is totally screened in this picture. Could if we take out hidden, could we say uh, screened from view so that the house can't be? It's implied that the house can't be seen from the road. Well, then there wouldn't be any reason to not say hidden because that's what hidden means. It, if I may, if I may call up the image, I, I can't, but if I can refer to the image that David showed during one of the Hamlet sessions about what legally met, met the requirement of screening on Route 13. You, you know what I'm talking about, David? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was yeah. not my idea of screening. It, no one's idea of screening. It's, it, <laughs> well, well somebody's obviously. <laughs> but I mean, the issue here is it's hidden when practical, possible. Pick a, pick a, but, but at the well, minimum. Well, example would be, you know, that the one you had at the house earlier that could have been put behind the barn. That would hide it pretty well. <laughs> well, from a straight on view, yeah. you can still see it from King Road. Yeah, well, then, you know, that's, that's that's so. Those are the practical considerations that a planning board would take in, would take into you know into the into the process. Um, you know, you could have you could have planted some trees along the edges that would come you know completely hide it then. You know? Yeah, and it's oh, a lot yeah. easier to hide a double wide that's only one story high than it is to hide one of these you know eight thousand square foot two story um, you know McMansions that people built. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a problem leaving hidden in because it says hidden or screened. I mean it's either. Um. And that 
I, I don't have a problem leaving it in. And it and it says should and when possible. Yeah, that, that's fine. D David, yeah. does does the yeah. language match uh, similar guidelines in other places? I mean, is this sort of standard language in planning? I wish there were standards in planning. <laughs> <laughs> I would say this is in the vein of what lots of places have. There's a there's variety. Yeah. Uh, from more prescriptive to less prescriptive, more flexible to less flexible. And, and also I tend towards plain language and lots of people who do zoning, everything is in legalese. Um, right. But I, it's definitely within the realm of the way a guideline would be used. My fear is that if you say hidden or screened, I, I have trouble with the word hidden because it's so absolute, but if you say hidden or screened, the practical meaning of that is merely screened. So you, you've almost erased the word hidden. I, if, if you wanted to be careful about it, you would say hidden when practical, otherwise screened. And in fact, as we know from walking up King Road, plenty of people want to be hidden and choose to be hidden, so. It's true too. Well, Absolutely. King Road is a very good example of that. Yes, you don't have a problem with the hidden or hidden or screened is okay with me. Yeah, I, mean, I wonder as how much you understand that that means screened. I'm okay with it. You know, it's it's if that's what you want. I would, you know, in light of this recent comment, I would almost say drop the screened. Oh, make it stronger. Well, you know, it should be hidden if possible. Hidden if possible. Hidden or how about hidden as much as is practical? I'm mean, just looking for words that'll mean something. Is, so, is it practical for us to be going over these the semantics of these guidelines? I mean, yeah, it is. It's important. You know, I think so, it would. I think it's practical if we can find consensus around something. If everyone right. has their own idea, there's not. No, really it might not be consensus. <laughs> no. Well, so, actually, that, so, that's a good thing to forward to the town board as well, that we, we discussed this at length and could not reach a, something that everyone was happy with. Mm -hmm. So something but, that was said earlier on them. <laughs> is, is uh, I think Ted said, and people agreed that have been around for a while, is that, um, you know, there hasn't been language for site plan, site plan review and it hasn't been enforced, right? But I think it's it's all a judgment, right? I mean, it, we're sort of kidding ourselves that people are going to use exact words all the time. I mean, we have the the zoning, which is the target. Then we have variances in one direction and site plan review in the other, right? And we're going to end up somewhere in there based on humans making decisions, right? And if the history is that people tend to be sort of giving and allowing people to do things, then I think it's probably better to at least have language in that allows them to stop something that that we definitely mm -hmm. don't want, right? And the tendency is to sort of gravitate towards the middle, which is the zoning, right? That's just yeah. sort of how but, I see it. I think that's a great point, Brad. And yeah. I, so there's two things that I want to say. One is to answer some of Kevin's questions here, which is kind of who is making these decisions? And the answer is the planning board. And yeah. then the next, I think, thought that is useful is I don't think that the planning board would interpret any of the suggestions that anyone has made significantly differently from any of the other ones. Um, so, you know, we are kind of wasting time spinning wheels debating between them because they all convey the same goal to the planning board um, who is going to interpret them in that flexible process. At the risk of repeating myself, we may have a different planning board in the future, but the planning board we have had in the past has tended to interpret those in favor of the applicant and not apply restrictions when not absolutely required to. Just an observation. So I'd suggest it sounds like there's not uh, support for removing number 14. Or for, uh, for changing can, it either. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of ideas about changing it, but they all end up at about the same thing. So I'm going to suggest <laughs> we move on to number 16, 
um, which is similar, uh, but slightly different. Views should be protected and impacts on views should be minimized or mitigated. Um, and so this is slightly different. It's not about necessarily about uh, just, sorry. It's not just about um, siding along the street, um, which is really what number 14 does, but it considers a wider, a more expansive concept of views. So it could impact a house that um, would be seen, you know, across a valley or um, that's on top of a ridge or something like that. Right. Um, or, yeah, we take a look at the view down the street, so to speak. Um, yeah. Again, it has the word should, yep. right? So the flexibility. Yeah, yeah, there. Flexi it's flexible. Yeah. So, so the question is more, is this a value that we want the planning board prioritizing um, in some cases over the desires of a property owner um, in, with the purpose of protecting values of other people? Mm -hmm. um, so is that something that anyone else is interested in reducing or removing? Is the difference between 14 and 16 that 14 um, oh is for close by neighbors versus 16, the word views would mean distant neighbors? Yep. Sort of. I mean, well, the, also, I mean it, another it, thing I, well, I think about with this is an example would be um, when Longview was going in, uh, the people who lived in the first house uphill from Longview, they, the original design and placement of, of Longview would have blocked their view of, their whole view of Cuga Lake. <laughs> and actually Longview moved the buildings. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, okay. that, you know, that's an example of that. I mean, yeah. there and are a number also, of places in Danby that you can see the lake. Yeah. yeah. I'll give and you an I example. Think it also, it also um, adds some protection in a different way, right? So you could add screening that would hide a house that would block someone else's view. Yeah, so or the view yeah. from the road. Yeah. Yeah. Longview had been trying to screen their building from their neighbor by putting a bunch of trees along the property line and completely blocking their view of yeah. the lake. You know, they would be meeting number 14, right? Uh, but not meeting number 16. Um, let me ask a, for an example or give you an example and ask you what your thoughts are. Take my house as an example. Um, I can see very few houses, but there must be somebody over in West Danby who before me simply saw an unbroken hill and now sees a broken hill with a house smack dab in the middle of it, albeit two miles away. Where are we? On that sort of situation, where where does the impact on the view become important? I think well, that's, that, you know, that's something the planning board would have to decide, and the town could help them by adopting yeah. a view shed priority list. Right. Um, but in the absence of that, they would have to decide: is you know everything is a view, so they have to decide how important is a particular view. Um, and they have to balance it, um, impacts on that view with impacts on the property owner. Right, and, and, and there are ways to mitigate, and mitigation's in there. You know, well, by, you know, tucking the building into the, in, so that it doesn't stick up above the ridge line, um, using muted shades rather than white, you know, so, so that it doesn't stand out in the landscape. Um, so it would, it would be would be interpreted by the planning board, and I can't really tell you exactly where they would come down on something. But if the team wanted to give them more guidance in terms of to saying what views are important, um, that would be helpful. Would it would it help to give a an actual? I, I hope I'm getting the right phrase. Uh, visual angle subtended. In other words, the the long view case it probably took up 45, pick a number, 50, 190 degrees of their view. In the case that I gave with my house, it's probably one or two degrees of somebody's view, but it's it, somewhere between them is where it, the cutoff somewhere. 
Yeah, well, as I say, you, you know, there are ways of mitigating and, and whether it's important depends on a lot of variables that we haven't ever much dealt with. Yep. So yes. with, with that limited explanation, um, is there anyone who would like to reduce or remove 16? I, I kind of I kind of think that it would be nice to make that a weak statement because and be protected. You know, to 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 make it to make it you know a consideration, but not a terribly strong consideration. Because when someone, says. how about I mean, what when when I think I wrote this, I had in mind the view, the public view. How would you feel about public view should be protected? Well, that changes. No, no. That, I think that changes no. dramatically. <laughs> no, that changes, changes everything. Yeah. The, the the problem with public view is that uh, <laughs> as you drive down the road, you, <laughs> you you get a hell of an impact out of a very small object. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like no one, loose. no one, there's no majority of people who are interested in removing or reducing sixteen. Um, so I think we can move on to 17, which is new development and new lots should be arranged to minimize fragmentation of existing contiguous fields and habitat. Um, I like we, that one. Me too. I, I wish Kevin could, could you tell us what it is that most bothers you about that particular one? In the chat, that is. And I'm, not, I'm sure it's not because a range is misspelled. Or minimize. Or minimize. Or minimize. Or minimize. <laughs> it's, Spanish. it's Spanish for minimize. I was yeah, waiting, right. Joel, for you to correct the spelling. Well, I couldn't do it. So, uh oh. Um, I just know I in range. We got it. <laughs> And worse, David yes. versus L correct. <laughs> there you go. Is it two R's? Is it, is it two R's? <laughs> yeah, so that was a, that was double a, letters are not my forte. <laughs> that was a character it is two R's. mini me or something. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. I've appeased the spelling gods now. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. You're you're. Audio is not working, Ted, um, or Kevin. Kevin. Um, so Kevin says his objective is that it's, it's subjective. His problem with um, wanting to minimize fragmentation is that it's subjective. It depends on who you're talking to. I, I, I have a feeling that Russ would not agree with what we call fragmentation. Oh yeah. my God. Just It's just a feeling. Yep. Um, but, well, well um, uh, for, uh, one example of that would be the, the building, the building on Miller Road, the, you know, the flag lot that got put in and, and then the fellow, I mean, he put up a garage and now he's building, he's going to build a house. I mean, that, that uh, at some point people were talking about putting the house in the mid, way back, as far back as possible, so you can see it from the road. And that this huge uh, agricultural field that that would be cutting it right in the middle. Um, I mean that that's what I think of when I when I read that sentence. Um, there are ways to not to not do that. Well, it, um, it would be would it, would it feel any better if we change fragmentation to breaking up? Fragmentation well, is a technical let's, term. Let's what just... is the problem? <laughs> it's fragmenting. Maybe you could not. You could say to minimize fragmenting <sighs> contig contiguous fields and habitat. There you go. There we go. Oh. <clears throat> to avoid fragmenting, you can't minimize fragmenting. I think that's the term is fragmentation. Uh, yeah. But fragmenting fields, you can minimize fragmenting fields. Yep. yep, fragmenting habitats, fragmenting. So, uh, 
we'll, we'll get into grammar focus, here. If we can yeah. focus on the, the actual, what's at stake here with the rule rather than the... Um, Terminology. Yeah. Yeah, so again, examples. Uh, Leslie is talking about a house out in the middle of, of open agricultural fields. Which yeah, that's is kind of the classic example of what we're talking classic, about. Right? Classic example that we're talking about. Um, the, the, all those houses on West King Road that you can't see from the road, those are houses that, that are back in the middle of woods. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. not, I'm, my humble opinion, that's not quite the same thing. Not necessarily bad. They're uh, not in the middle of the woods. But yeah, since, some of those are pretty close to the road. Some of them. Since, you, since you brought that up, uh, there has been one other thing that's come up through this that we don't have any control over at all. And that's a house two doors to my north is um, a rental house with a driveway. That house is reasonably, well, it's from, the, it, it is in woods. And the power company came along this past year and they cut a huge, <laughs> huge swath at a big angle all the way back to the house and they took out some incredibly big trees so now that house is visible when you're go driving south on west kings straight up and there's nothing that we can do about that unless we unless we convince the power company that that i, I it could be a 50 foot wide swath what, what then, we can what we can do is require people to bury cables or right. encourage them to and not transmission right. lines probably <laughs> Yeah, that's the hard one with the power line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the case that she's talking about is is it's private Ted. access cable. Ah. No, no. There's a power line through there, Ted. The power line. It's their power line. It's in the air. Mean, it's to in the, the air. house. Yeah, to the is, house. Is it, is it a distribution yeah, that's line? Access. Or is so it that's what Ted's line? talking about. Oh, you mean private? You meant private power line. Yeah. Correct. In other words, the drop the drop line from the road to their house. We should be encouraging or requiring it to be buried so that wouldn't happen. The right. power company wouldn't be able to come in and cut the trees. Right. That's only common I like that, of course. I'd like to bury mine and have them done with it. Maybe come. I should. Yeah, they do. Not to the house. Nice. Not no. to the house. No, not to That's the house. What I was talking about. No. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I like 17. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have a, an, an investment in 17. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Kevin did add um, that, yes, Russ does feel that way. And um, that Kevin doesn't mind um, pointing out this as a consideration, but doesn't think that the planning board should ever be requiring it. Um, and that many, there are many people who don't believe that fragmentation is that important um, of an issue, that it should be something included here. And I think that's fair. I, I also want to point out that this isn't only about fragmenting habitat. It's also something, um, you know, when you place a house in a field that could be farmed, right. you know, where this is also trying to avoid um, messing up the possibility of doing ag activities on that parcel right. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. For so the future, it, yeah. 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 Right. So yeah. It, it's, it's really more, it's as much about keeping as much of the parcel kind of intact okay. and undisturbed yeah. as possible. Right. And that has environmental consequences, it has character consequences, and it also has you know, usability for ag or for other use um, consequences. And it could even have consequences on the possibility of future subdivision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. David, you mentioned that the ag folks had um, made a request or made a suggestion, uh, but I don't think you ever told us what it was. Uh, yeah, I'll get, <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> Oh, we're, we're kind of out of time, but I'd like to just wrap up the discussion of 17. Um, if it, it sounds, I'm not hearing anyone else say that they would like to get rid of or reduce how this sounds. I do, I do think that it is fairly flexible. I will say um, to, to Kevin's point, Kevin, to your point, I, 
this does give the planning board some ability to make some requirements, but I think it does give them some flexibility to do it reasonably. Okay, um, so I think I'm not hearing significant interest in changing that from others. So but that <laughs> I, I would not like to talk about this right now, but I would like to put it out there that if you think there are other parameters that would be good to add to this, please let me know. Let's not, we don't have time to talk about them right now, but yeah. I'm sure really there are really. some good ideas. Um, I want to add um, that the Ag Committee has asked me, well, I think they're, they're still deciding, but it was pretty clear from their meeting that they like this idea of having a floating zone for agricultural support, um, mm. sorry, the, it's not flowing over, uh, commercial or light industry businesses. So um, what this would mean is that the town would make parameters for um, some of these, oh, sorry, Brad, I, are you, I got distracted. Brad's comment, does new development include all buildings? That's important. Um, As opposed to just dwelling. Uh, in the site yeah. plan review parameters. Um, right, determine new development. Yeah, I, I think that includes all new buildings. Um, yeah. Although I would note that there wouldn't apply to ag buildings in an ag zone. Right. Right. Or, it, it doesn't, does it include I don't know if this is just a minor point, but it does it include non-building permit buildings? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, sheds under 150 square feet, that kind of thing. Only if they're subject to site plan review, because that, that's what this is, is parameters for site plan review. So, yeah. were, oh, so that, that brings up the other question that was mentioned in a previous week. At what point, what, what's the dividing line between reviewable and non-reviewable buildings? I, I think the example was the 1,600 square foot garages. We, have, we don't forget to talk about it. Yeah, well, well, we will have that on the agenda. Um, but I want to wrap up um, this loading zone. Okay, so yeah. the Ag Committee identified some uses that are needed to support the ag community in the area and are not allowed anywhere. Um, examples were butcher, slaughterhouse, um, someplace that you could process nuts or grains that were um, grown here uh, to do value added things, places that, to do this that are not on the farm. Because right now doing this on the farm where it's grown is protected by ag and markets. Um, but if a bunch of farmers wanted to get together and um, have a fiber processing plant where you know all of the people who have alpacas or whatever things are producing hair that are being turned into yarn, if they wanted to share that as a co-op or something, it would be off their farm. Um, they, they like the idea of a place like that being allowed. And I explained um, that there definitely is not, in my opinion, a desire to allow something like that everywhere in any zone. Um, I can't imagine any of these zones, us just making you know, a, a nut processing plant unallowed by right use. Um, but I could imagine a floating zone that had parameters for when something like this could be possible, could be allowed. And maybe those parameters include a really large lot size, deep setbacks, um, other kind of mitigating factors for what is a fairly high impact use. Um, and then someone would have to apply to have that floating zone applied to a particular parcel with a rezoning. So it would be a discretionary action by the town board. I would like to request that this be postponed until the next meeting. It seems to me to be a much too important and complex issue to, for us to be dealing with now. Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna make a decision. He's just on, mentioning it. Yeah, I'm kind of letting you know that I. Letting you know what to make, so we can ruminate on it. In the meantime, um, and that right. we ruminate. That's that. cute. That that's really all I I had to say about it is that it's something that the uh, that I think makes sense and that the ad committee um, 
came out of their meetings and uh, I'd like to add it to my proposal and it doesn't yeah. really fit. In and in conjunction with that, the, the, the whole upshot of the what other kinds of businesses people are willing to tolerate in, uh, in outside of the hamlets and uh, under what circumstances or is, is something that's still unresolved as well. I, yeah. I also want to point out that a lot of these uh, suggested uses require a lot of water. And uh, that could threaten the water for other people who already are there. Mm -hmm. David, um, yep. in the past, I mean, one of the things that um, has come up a number of times, um, and I, we started working on it right before COVID hit, um, what were, was, was the notion of site plan review for, for ag development and or activity. Um, I, we're, can we, is that totally separate or, I mean, I, I mean, I still want to see that yeah. <laughs> and that, that could help with this, um, with the floating zone. Which is what um, I was getting at. Yeah. So, um, so there's two, there's two things there. One is there's a very, very clear guidance from ag and markets about how you can do site plan for these kind of ag, um, value added uses that are part of a farm. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, we could convene a committee to talk about that. But my suggestion is we just adopt the acceptable ag and markets process for streamlined site plan review for agricultural uses. Um, we know it's allowed. Okay. We don't have to spend time on it. Um, can, can we limit where, it? Where, where would I find that, David? Uh, I can. In markets? Yeah, it, I'll find it and and share it with you. Thanks. Can we can we limit that to what we would what we might call traditional agricultural uses? Probably not. Not yet. No. Not according to no. right to farm. Yeah. No. Well, you you know where I'm what, why I'm asking that question. I do know. Yeah, you know the, the definition of agriculture is changing over time, so it's a, right. It's yes. a, yeah. Yes. Um, so perhaps we should not use the words agriculture uses, but specifically talk about what it is that we are expediting. So Except the, that what the process market is wants not, to... so Ted, I want to be clear. This isn't about expediting. This is right. about adopting the most stringent process that ag and markets allows, which is more expedited than another process we could come up with, but it's the most, most intense review that's allowed. Thank you. Uh, yep. One other question, sorry to pester you, but um, let's use the example that you gave, uh, a nut processing plant. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if one of the reasonably distant neighbors uh, came forward with an extreme nut allergy? I'm just right. asking. With extreme what? Nut allergy. Uh oh Like they were worried that dust in the air was going to impact them in some way? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm just asking because I want to know. <laughs> They're going to have a tough time in Danby, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. You yeah. mean that th there are a lot of people with nut allergies? It was an attempt at humor, sorry. It's late. <laughs> oh, well, that's what I'm asking, is, is that was the humor? I think what he was saying is that there's a lot of nuts. Exactly. <laughs> oh. Uh, a lot of regulating going on there. A lot of nuts and dandy. <laughs> so Ted, what, what would happen is because it's not a use that's allowed in a zone that's on the ground, someone has to apply for a zoning change to apply this zone to the ground. So if someone had a problem with it, they felt like it uh, impacted them in a way, you presented one way, there could be lots of ways they could could feel impacted by it, they would lobby the town board to not accept that rezoning or in accepting that rezoning to require some kind of mitigations um, that would reasonably protect them. So it's, it's not something that's just allowed to happen somewhere. There's a process where it has to come before the town board, which is a fairly significant process to do a rezoning. And if, if the same group that same cooperative said, okay, we would like to change that parcel to ag zoning. In that case. Well, yeah, that sorry. has been discussed by that ag group too. 
In and, the, I meant ag district, district. Oh, oh, well, yeah, we're talking about ag district pretty much for this. We're talking about what can, to what degree can we regulate or, you know, businesses in the ag district if they're ag businesses. And well, so I, I want to back up a little bit because what I'm actually talking about is things that would not be protected by ag and markets that would not be um, allowed yes. as agriculture activity. So in the right. case of the nut processing plant, if you want to process nuts from your farm on your farm, that's protected. If you want to process nuts from a whole bunch of other people's farms, that's not protected. So that is what would be allowed and by a floating zone that would require a rezoning by the town board to put on a parcel. Right, and my question was, I'm pretending I'm that nut processing cooperative. The next thing I'm gonna do is apply for inclusion in the ag district, which changes it to the opposite category. It doesn't make a difference. No, They're not a farm, so they don't get protection from ag and markets. They're a factory. You know, at some point, it's, it's kind of like the hemp facility we had on Holland Road. You know, we were arguing that that's not an agricultural use when it scales up to industrial scale. Right, and, but and the argument, I want to be clear that, that Joel, the argument oh, wasn't yeah. about the scale, it was about accepting material from other farms. Other farms. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's part of why it was at a, a, a much larger scale and impact than it would be if it was all in one processing just in stuff from one farm. Sure, but if that farmer owned 10,000 acres of hemp fields, they would have a right to that processing facility on that land. If they were in the Ag District, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If they had 10,000 hemp fields. Yeah, but that, that, as much would. as we don't like it, we can't say no to CAFOs or to large scale operations. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I could see this could be a long tangential discussion. So another time maybe. Yeah. However, it's worth pointing out that the probability of any of that happening in Danby is slim. Murphy's Law. Strong, you're, you're looking at a strong believer in Mr. Murphy's Law. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, th I think we've, we've gotten as much done tonight as we can. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I appreciate you all sticking it out. We're now at about 920. So yep. I'd like to call it a night. Um, so when do we next meet? Well, the, I think that's a kind of a question um, yeah. of what we would do at a next meeting because next week I will be giving a, a draft to the town board, which will be a presentation. It's not going to be ready before that. It's going to be ready that night <laughs> and I will present it and it will be then available for a month for people to consider and think about and bring comments to the board. Um, we could meet with this group um, for people to ask clarifying questions and get answers. Um, we would we will not be making any changes during that time. That will be time that is for people to consider and then bring their thoughts to the town board the following month. Um, so I would be open to meeting then for the purpose of clarifying people's questions. And I would also be open to not meeting um, next month or to meeting once with each group next month for clarifying questions or for meeting for an hour twice with each group <laughs> next month. Uh -huh. um, so I'm kind of open to, to your thoughts and ideas on that. Hmm. August is a traditionally uh, busy month and vacation-y for some people. And I'm wondering if uh, and psychoanalysts would, take the whole it, month off it would give you a break david you've got a busy month preparing the the uh, yeah. presentation to the board yep i think i, I think my inclination would be to, to see how the board reacts i mean they may want to they may uh, the board may say uh, i have a, we have no problem with this or we have a lot of problems with this and that some some of this warrants revisiting and send it back uh, well, Joel, I think that's gonna that's what's gonna happen um, at the not this coming meeting, but at the meeting after that, because people are just gonna be getting it at this right, and then they'll have and they'll have a, a month to comment and so forth. Yeah, yeah, and then 
And then following that, the board will direct me and by extension us yes, sir, on yeah. what additional work needs to be done, where we should focus and where people are comfortable. Mm -hmm. not, not knowing what the reaction will be, uh, perhaps we should just plan on meeting as we have been until we know that we need, don't need to. Well, we're not gonna have the reaction until August. Right, I don't see much point. Right. I think we should give David a, a rest. Yep. Well, we should put it down. There's gonna be a lot to chew on. Yep. All right, that sounds good to me. And I'll be dealing with the solar application. <laughs> Oh, is that oh, gosh. Yep. oh, some rest. <laughs> yeah. All okay. right. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good Take night. care. Good night. Good night.